Um, so good afternoon. So welcome back to the the, the NITUC, uh, mini school series on parallel computation with GPUs, so an introduction to programming with CUDA. Um, and so uh, today is the the last lecture in the in this series, and it will be given by um, Prof Yappi Grief. Sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, and so uh, so the, the format is the same as the previous week. So um, so we'll have a, a, a roughly hour long lecture and then at the end, and also during the, uh, at the end we'll have questions, but during the, the course of the lecture, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to type this into the, to, into the Q and A facility in Zoom. And um, I believe that Prof Martin Buchner will um, answer the questions in, in the, in the Q and A. And so, um, I believe there's still some people joining, so maybe we can just wait one minute before um, before we be begin with today's lecture. Great, thank you, Graham. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's enough time for people to to join us. Okay, so welcome everyone to this uh, fourth lecture on uh, parallel computation with GPUs. I think by now uh, you're probably quite sick of the abstract on the first page, so I just put in the the title of uh, thinking in parallel. Uh, in terms of who we are, we are the same presenters that you've had for the last three lessons. So I think by now you should be quite uh, quite comfortable with the with the two of us. So in terms of what we're going to cover. Uh, in this lesson, we will look a little bit at the concept of thinking in parallel and, you know, why it is different to uh, to thinking in the way we would normally think when we are programming on, on a CPU. We're going to look at an example of tree generation, uh, which if you are very interested, uh, I will link to, uh, uh, to an article or two on how you can go through that whole process. But that's just to kind of introduce to us uh, some of the concepts that we need to take into account when we are thinking in parallel. Then we're going to look at the idea of combining work between the CPU and the GPU so that we don't necessarily use one or the others, but, but, uh, but use them at the same time. We're going to look at this uh, with an example of sorting. And once we've done the sorting uh, algorithm, we're going to spend a bit of time looking at atomic operations. And then finally, we're going to talk about access to the cluster and where you can send your details in order to get access to the cluster so that you could start playing with this code yourself. Obviously, if you don't have uh, any hardware that you could do it on your own laptop or desktop. OK, so up till now, we have shown work that can be done completely in parallel in kernels. So with the examples of you know, the vector addition or the matrix addition or matrix multiplication, this is something where you take all of the memory uh, or all of the information that you have on the host side, copying it to a, a position in memory, and then run everything on the kernel. And then when you finish, copy everything out again. But now what we're going to find is that there are going to be a number of instances where when solving a problem, you find that there are some parts that are absolutely good to do on the GPU and you want to do it in parallel, but other parts that, that really aren't suited to be, to be done on the CPU. And this is what we want to focus on today is to see, you know, when do you use which one and when do you combine the two? But now before we can consider, you know, where we make that decision, there are a couple of factors that just influence the way our problem is structured and the algorithm that we're going to use. Uh, that that will let us know whether the problem is something that can be done in parallel appropriately or whether we wouldn't get any kind of execution benefit uh, to running it on our GPU. And the main concepts we're going to look at are divergence and occupancy. Now, divergence comes in two flavors, specifically execution divergence and date divergence. And although it's obviously more complex than this, the basic idea is that for execution divergence, when you have threads in the same block, if they are all doing the same thing, then things will run very, very quickly. 
But if you have, you know, control flow decisions that, you know, sometimes a thread will do one thing, sometimes it'll do another thing, and the threads in the same block are going to sometimes be doing things that are slightly different, this is going to slow down the entire process. And this is what we call execution diverge. So for our algorithm to run efficiently, we want to make sure that each thread is doing exactly the same thing. Okay? The next concept we've got is data divergence. And I think uh, Martin has introduced us to quite a bit of, uh, of this concept already. But the idea is that in the same block uh, that is processing, are the threads accessing memory that is close together? So is it memory that's very accessible to that specific block? Or are different threads accessing memory that are all over the GPU? Uh, the further away the memory is between the threads, and specifically, obviously, you know, with the with the caveats that Prof Martin added last time, um, the further your memory is away from, you know, where the, the other threads are accessing it, the higher the cost to performance. Okay, so those are the two concepts of divergence. The next concept we've got is occupancy, and this is basically saying that for you to get the most out of your GPU you need to be using the maximum number of threads and blocks that you can. Uh, because if you are offloading something to the GPU and it is only utilizing a couple of threads, what you're actually doing is using a less efficient you know, processor to solve a problem that you could have actually just solved on the CPU. So if you don't need a lot of threads, th then it's really not going to be suited to, to parallel processing. And as an example of this, let us consider the generation of a tree. So this is our, our standard binary tree and uh, how we want to set it up for a number of nodes. So we've got eight leaf nodes on the bottom, and we want to build a binary tree from this. Okay. So assuming that we have our low nodes you know, um, sorted, uh, we can start splitting it up into, into this binary tree. But what we find is if we do it the standard way, the way we would do it on our CPU, Okay, we would look at all eight of the nodes and we'd split it in the middle. And then we'd say for the root node, there are going to be two child nodes, each of which is a, uh, an internal node. And they will each have, you know, four child nodes below them, which will have, you know, internal nodes inside of them. But that first operation of making the split only uses one thread because you're only looking at the root node. In the next step, you look at one layer down, uh, the two internal nodes that you've now created, which now each have four um, leaf nodes below them. And this is again going to split it into uh, two internal nodes each. Uh, in the example that is given here in the image, uh, the node on the right-hand side has now uh, split itself to have you know, a single node on the left-hand side of the internal node and three child nodes on the right-hand side. But again, if we go one layer deeper, we're only going to use three uh, or four threads uh, in order to do this evaluation if, until we get to the end where we're using you know, eight of the threads to look at each of the leaf nodes and terminate on the tree. So what we'll find is for this problem, this is not a good candidate to, to run in parallel because as we go deeper, we use more threads but it's really only at the bottom of the tree that we're going to have a pretty good occupancy. But what we can do is we can flip the problem on its head and consider that for any binary tree, it is going to have n minus one internal nodes, okay? And if we assume that our leaf nodes are already sorted, then we can start an algorithm that creates one thread for each internal node and then looks below it to see whether it has got leaf nodes on the bottom or if there's more than two uh, nodes below it then obviously it is going to be uh, 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 referencing other internal nodes and doing it from the bottom up instead of from the top down means that we will from the beginning have all of our threads processed which is a much better use of our GPU and has a much better occupancy um, obviously, this algorithm is a little bit more complex than what I've described it now. So there is in the references at the end a full article as to how to do this um, with pseudocode and everything. So if you're interested, please read through that. But uh, in this lesson, we're going to do a slightly less complex example just for the purposes of time. So if we consider this now, 
the basic CUDA program that we have introduced to you in the last couple of lessons has roughly followed this structure, okay? So it starts out in main because everything we've done has been console applications. And the first step is to allocate memory space on the GPU for our data. We then allocate memory space on the host. I mean, obviously this can be the other way around as well. But once we've allocated the, the memory on both sides, we copy data from our CPU side, from our host, onto the, the memory on the device, on the GPU. And then we call um, a function that either inside of it calls a kernel or we just call the kernel directly. And that um, does all of the processing in a number of threads on the GPU. And once it is finished and we've synchronized our device, we transfer the results back to the CPU from the GPU and we free up any memory that we've allocated. But this assumes basically one CPU thread um, that is running you know, sequentially and all of the, the sort of heavy computation is run in one big block on the kernel uh, or in, inside the kernel on the GPU. But is this the only way? And obviously the answer is no. Okay, so often what we will find is that we're gonna do some work on the CPU and some work on the GPU, depending on work, what works best for our, uh, for our problem. So we will call the kernels when we need stuff done on the GPU, but otherwise we are just going to run in, uh, obviously also in a multi-threaded way on our, G on our CPU, but we're going to use each processor for what it is good for, okay? So we're going to work through a simple example of this, um, in the form of the uh, sorting algorithm called BrickSort. And we're going to show the differences between running on the CPU versus the GPU, okay? So the sorting algorithm we, we will look at is BrickSort. Uh, it is very similar to BubbleSort, and that is the, the algorithm that we're going to compare it to. Uh, BubbleSort is the, the version that you would use on the CPU, um, and BrickSort is the version that you will use on the GPU. So first... Let us consider bubble sort and how it works, you know, conceptually. And then we will consider brick sort to show us how we can take bubble sort and run it in parallel. So with our bubble sort algorithm, we start with an array of numbers or an array of whatever, in this case, numbers. And that is the position in memory that we want to have sorted. So we're assuming that we've now taken it from some sort of input position and we've placed it in this memory location and we want to have it sorted here. And once it's sorted, we want to exit the output. So the first thing we're gonna do with bubble sort is we're gonna look at each element in the array and its neighbor, okay? So obviously we'll start at position zero. We're gonna look at this element and, the, the, and its neighbor, and we're gonna compare whether the values are in the correct order. So in this case, we want the low numbers on the left and the high numbers on the right. So for four and five, these two elements are in the wrong order. So we want to swap their positions. So for index one, we run a swap operation. Now that we've swapped index uh, zero and one, we look at index one next. So the next one in the array. Again, we look at whether the, uh, the values inside of the array are in the correct order. And if they are not, we swap. We move one index along, and in this instance, we've got five and six, which means that they are in fact in the correct order, at least when looking between these two positions. So we will stay. We're not going to do a swap operation. For six and seven, again, we will stay because they're in the right order. Seven and eight, we will stay because they're in the right order. Eight and two, we're again going to swap because two is smaller than eight. So we perform a swap operation on these two indices. And then for the final one, we have position uh, number eight and three. And again, we're going to perform a swap. So after the first pass of our array, we are guaranteed to have the biggest number all the way on the right. Okay? But now if you had an, a, a situation where the smallest number in your array was all the way on the right and it needed to go down to the left, you would have to run this, uh, uh, this uh, algorithm at least n number of times in order for each you know, iteration of going through the entire array um, to allow the, the smallest number to propagate all the way to the left. So in the worst case, we will find that this algorithm has a time complexity of on squared as we need to traverse each pair individually. 
Okay. Now, in the example we're doing now, we're going to use the worst case situation because we want to do a comparison. But generally, when you're implementing a sort algorithm, you would have some sort of flag that you check to make sure that the array isn't already sorted. So we are going to assume the worst case a situation where we would have to go through it a number of times in a uh, um, in two loops, but that won't necessarily be the case. Okay. But again, now that we've switched all the way to the front again of the array, we're going to do exactly the same operation that we did in the first step, etc. So I'm not going to go through it every single time. So that is roughly how our bubble sort is going to work. Our brick sort is now the parallel version of this. So again, we're going to be looking at pairs of numbers to compare them and swap them, but we're going to alternate between odd pairs and even pairs, okay. and we're going to do all of the pairs at the same time. So how does this work? In our first step, we look at all of the even, uh, well, all of the odd um, combination, so uh, zero and one, uh, two and three, four and five, uh, six and seven, okay? So we look at all of those pairs at the same time and again do a swap if they're not currently in the right position. So that is one operation that we run on the GPU, in, in this case, four threads. In the next step, we're going to look at the other set of pairs, okay? So we increment the index by one, and then we again swap if the positions or if the values are not in the correct position, otherwise we stay. The index that is right at the end, obviously we don't perform any swap operations on there because its neighbor would be outside of the array. So in this case, we still have four threads. It is just that there are only three stay or swap operations that are going to be happening. So we're going to perform this process in exactly the same way, looping over the array a number of times, but obviously doing all of the internal loop operations in parallel. So what we will see is if we go through this a number of times, the actual sorting of our array is substantially faster. So here, by just going through six iterations of uh, the looping algorithm, we have sorted our array, whereas on the bubble sort, we would have had to go through both uh, an external loop and an internal loop in order to sort all of our values. Okay, so now, we will use these two algorithms for two things, okay? We are going to combine the CPU and GPU code in brick sort, and then we're going to compare bubble sort and brick sort for different numbers of blocks and different numbers of threads, okay? Uh, apologies for the sound in the background. I've just got, I'm just sharing an office at the moment. Okay, so if we look at our code now, okay? Um, this is just some of the boilerplate that we have in the front. Obviously, you will have access to all of the code in the GitHub. We again are going to uh, include all of the libraries that we need in order to do our CUDA operations. And we're going to add some error checking. So this is just a, a, a definition for a command that is going to allow us to run a CUDA command and then um, output to standard error if there are any problems. And we specifically take in file and line in order to report where the error happened inside of our code. So again, error checking is generally a good thing for us to be doing. Next, we look at the sorting and timing of the algorithm on the CPU. So as we read through this code, we will see right at the top, we're going to add um, start and stop variables. We're also going to create a float variable in order to take the time. And we're going to have two event um, variables, which we're going to use for the start and topping um, events on CUDA in order to allow us to do the timing. We're going to pass in our data pointer, and that is going to copy um, data. Uh, in this instance, it's going to just use the standard array copy um, to take the data that is inside of our input array and copy it to an output array, which we're going to be where we do the sorting. Then we create um, the two CUDA events, the start and stop event. And then where I've got the, the arrow pointing into uh, saying that there's timing, we're going to start the CUDA event record for the starting of the time. Okay. And then we've got a nested loop 
which is going to be n on the outer loop and n minus one on the inside. And that is where we're going to do our bubble sort. Okay? The main operation that we've got inside of there is obviously just comparing the second position and the index. And if they are in the wrong uh, um, order, then we're just going to swap them around by using an intermediary variable that we call x at that point in time. Okay. So this is our simple bubble sort. At the end, we're going to trigger the, the stop event, which again uh, is going to capture a certain amount of time. We're going to synchronize the device, and then we're going to check the elapsed time by comparing the start event and the stop event and putting the output into the float um, time in milliseconds variable. We synchronize and we return the float variable that gives us the time. Okay. So this is the algorithm for our bubble sort. Okay. Next, we will look at the sorting and timing of our brick sort um, algorithm. It looks basically exactly the same. It's also got the variables at the start at for start and stop. We've got the timing variable. This time, we obviously have a data uh, pointer to the data on the device because we're now going to be copying it onto the GPU. We have two events that we create, the start and the stop event. We then do our CUDA malloc in exactly the same way as we've done in all of the lessons previously. And we copy the input data onto the pointer that we've created. Um, so we malloc the data first, or the, the, um, the space first, and then do the mem copy operation, copying from host to device. We then start our event, the start event specifically. This time, this code is running on the CPU still. So what you will see is it is now calling a kernel, uh, which we call odd even refactor, and it is going to pass in a variable that indicates how many threads there are per block, okay? And you will see in a moment why I'm doing that. And in calling this kernel, it is going to pass in the array of data as well as the iteration modded by two. So in other words, that's always gonna give us either a zero or a one, depending on whether it is an even or an odd operation. And then the size of the array, and we're going to split the, um, the, the size or the, the array into a number of blocks divided by uh, two as well, because obviously when we create our threads, um, we need half the amount of threads as there are indices in the array because we're dealing with pairs, okay? So we split first the, uh, the number of blocks based on the number of threads that we pass in, in addition to the number of threads that we allocate per block for it to happen. You will see how this works in a moment. I'm probably explaining it quite badly. Okay, we again do some error checking. And then every time we've gone through the process of calling this kernel to run the code in parallel, we do the CUDA device synchronization, okay? So we wanna make sure that all the threads are finished running, and then we will go on to the next loop on the CPU side of things. So can you see how that in the um, bubble sort, we had the nested loop. So there was the, the J loop on the inside of the I loop, okay? So that is N squared. Whereas now we are calling the kernel to run in parallel, which means we only need one loop, but we're still looping on the CPU side, okay? And the reason we want to do this is that we're jumping back and forth in our array, in our kernel, every single time that we call it. So that's much more complexity than what we want to have necessarily inside of the, um, the kernel. So we do the looping on the CPU side, CPUs are good at that, and the running in parallel on the kernel side, GPUs are good at that. Okay, so outside of the loop then, again, we record the stop event, and we, we synchronize the events and get the elapsed time. We print out um, uh, uh, that the array was sorted with however many blocks we indicated. We copy the memory uh, or the data back from the device back onto the host, and we synchronize the device and we returned the time that we've, that we've spent in this function. Now, the next function we've got is obviously the kernel itself. 
it looks very similar to what, what we had inside of the um, uh, of, uh, of the um, bubble sort. Okay, it's just that this side, well, this time, what you will see is that the index that's being looked at, okay, is going to take the thread ID, taking into account which block it's in, multiplied by two because we're working on um, the pairs of of indices, and then we add in that I, which was the um, the loop uh, value modded by two. So that is always going to be a zero or a one, which allows us to automatically know whether we are doing an even um, index or an odd index when we do the swap. We're just gonna do a little bit of balance checking. So obviously the reason I've done the index plus one as a variable is just because that variable is used quite often so that we can do it a single time. You can't necessarily assume that the compiler is going to do that for you if you are doing it on the device side, although, Mostly at this point in time, it is quite smart, um, but obviously the GPU processors are not quite as advanced as the CPU processors. So sometimes this sort of thing is, is worthwhile. But all I'm looking at is the index that we're pointing at, as well as its neighbor, which is the index plus one. We make sure that the index plus one or the second position is not outside of the array, which is just taking into account that um, lost index inside of our array. And then we just check whether um, the index and its neighbor, if the index is larger than its neighbor, which means it's in the opposite uh, order than what it needs to be, we create a second variable x, which we store the first um, number into, and then we perform the swap operation with the intermediary variable. So this is what's running inside of our kernel. But again, we're not looping or doing any kind of weird things like that in order to have you know, different um, uh, 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 divergence, okay? The only point where our thread may do something slightly different is right at the end. So the very last thread may not trigger if there isn't a neighbor for it to trigger on, but that is just one thread. So it shouldn't be a problem for our execution uh, divergence, okay? If we now look at our main, um, all we're going to do is take in how many elements uh, in the input array. In this instance, I've put a limit of 262,144 um, as the maximum size of the array, just because I was also testing the um, bubble sort. And if it gets bigger than that, it just takes a really, really long time. Um, so that was just the maximum value that I got there. Then I'm using the um, Mercy Twister engine which is part of the C++ standard library, uh, which is just a good way for you to get um, random numbers inside of a, a integer distribution. You can obviously use different distributions as well. Um, but in this case, we are just creating a distribution of numbers from one all the way up to double the size of the maximum um, uh, or the maximum size of the array. Uh, so there will always be you know, a bit of a spread in the numbers. This is after we've read from the user how many numbers they actually want to have with a little bit of balance checking, taking um, either the minimum of whatever the user put in or the maximum number A size. We allocate all of these random numbers to array A, which is now going to be our input array. And we again do an output of our device properties just to make sure that we've still you know, got uh, good access to our CUDA device. And then we create output arrays. Um, we're going to run um, eight uh, experiments with, uh, with the data that we pull in. So I've just called labeled them A to H. So these are the output arrays that are going to be used for the um, seven brick sorts as well as the bubble sort. Then um, just as a reminder on the top right, that is what we're passing in. We do the sort and timing where we take in the input data pointer, the output data pointer, the size of the array, and then the threads that we want to allocate per block. And we're going to have seven sorts run. Okay, We pass in the same input data because we want to make sure that we are sorting the exact same input to, to have a fair comparison. And then we just write the output results to the eight um, uh, uh, output arrays that uh, that I've created. 
And I'm going to run um, a single thread. So one thread per block in the first one, then 32 threads per block in the second one, 64, then 128, then 256, 512, and 1024. Okay, so 32 is the number, the size of a warp. So that is obviously how many threads you can have in a warp. And 1024 is the maximum number of threads that you can have a block on the hardware that I am using here. And then as our eighth sort, we're going to use the sort and time on the CPU, which is just our bubble sort using again, the exact same input. We're then just gonna print out um, the results of each of these tests uh, in milliseconds to the console, just for obviously our checking, okay? Then this looks like a huge amount of code, but all that's actually happening here is we're just comparing the outputs of each and every array to make sure that they are exactly the same. So we want to ensure that our, uh, our array sort has worked exactly the same, regardless of the number of threads and blocks that we've allocated to it, as well as the bubble sort. Because obviously, if our arrays are not equal, then there needs to be some debugging that happens. Obviously, uh, on the assumption that our arrays are equal, if we haven't gone into the um, the statement that says that our arrays are not equal because we've got some problem, then we're just going to record the amount of time that was taken for each and every one of these sort operations into a, Z a CSV file so that we can do some, uh, some graphing after the fact. Now, what you will see is on the very last size. So if we take the absolute maximum uh, size of array, which is the 262,144, what we see is that one thread um, per block with 131,000 blocks will give us 18.3 uh, seconds. So obviously this is in milliseconds, so 18,000 milliseconds. Um, for 32 threads, it works out to 2.8 uh, seconds. For 64 threads, 2.6, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So as you will expect, the maximum number of threads that we've got right at the bottom runs the fastest um, at 2.486 uh, seconds, but then if we compare that to the CPU, it's running at almost 150 seconds. Okay, so anything more than that would just be a huge amount of time to wait for. Okay, so this is very roughly the output of the um, of the uh, of the program that we've written. Again, we're using our um, device properties at the start to just get some stats about the the hardware that we're running on um, to compare this to the results that we're seeing, so we can see if there's any kind of problems in our occupancy and such. But with 128 blocks and 1,024 threads, we are using a fair chunk of the GPU at that point in time because there's only 128 multiprocessors available on the the GPU and 1,024 being the maximum number of threads you can have. So for the time that it's running, it's it's running fairly efficiently. Now, if we do this in a bit of a loop to just give us some data to work around, this is roughly what it's gonna look at. So what we did here is we just ran an experiment where we incremented the size of the data in steps of 4096. Mm -hmm and then just did a comparison between the different number of threads as well as the bubble sort. Um, we did in this experiment have an interesting uh, issue, uh, which is there marked in red, where for three of the runs, um, it actually ran a bit faster than what we were expecting. Now, this is one of the anomalies that you can obviously get on a Windows machine. This was run on a Windows machine because this device is also doing a bunch of graphical work in order to run my operating system. So during that small period of time, obviously there was more capacity available than there were in the other periods, um, which made it, made it run a little bit faster. But you'll see on the graph, it is just an outlier at those uh, specific points. The graph is actually quite clear. So if we look at these experiments now, graphing basic, basically everything, we will see that our bubble sort is going to run as we expected, n squared, it is getting exponentially slower. So as we add more data, it just gets slower and slower and slower, you know, exponentially. So that is the, the, the dots in brown. The dots in orange is going to be one thread per block and Initially, it sort of keeps up with uh, the dots in blue, which is 1,024 threads per block. But what we will see is that 
at a certain point, it starts to diverge and also almost become um, uh, 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 exponentially slower because the overhead in creating each block is becoming more and more and more. Um, so that actually diverges from the bottom uh, graph quite quickly as we increase the amount of data. If we look a little bit deeper um, and we ignore for a moment the CPU situation, if we just compare um, again in orange, the, the single thread per block model, we can now very clearly see on the five second scale how it is getting exponentially bigger. But the other com uh, combination of blocks and threads are much closer together to each other and are increasing quite linear. So we haven't hit the, uh, the, the problem in uh, at, at the 32 uh, threads per block stage where the overhead is becoming you know, too much of a problem, okay? So it is definitely a problem on one thread per block, but on 32 for the size of this specific problem, it seems to be okay. Again, if we now remove the single thread per block, we can see that the best operation is, or the best performance, is 1,024 uh, threads per block, and the others do worse, but still increase quite linear. And obviously just highlighting those three data points that, uh, that dropped out there on the bottom. So if we look at just the boundary cases um, of 32 threads and 1,024 threads, so the light blue being 32 and the dark blue being 1,024, we can see that again, the overhead of having more blocks is causing some divergence here. Um, so, so we want to maximally occupy each of the blocks that we're actually using in order to get the best performance out of our GPU. But, and, and here is where the, the important caveat comes in. If we look at the data that we got, in fact, the first operation of a 4,096 sized uh, 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 array, okay, was substantially faster on the CPU, okay? So somewhere between you know one one uh, element and a thousand uh, four thousand and ninety six elements, the CPU was actually quite a bit faster, and there was a, a critical value between zero and that number where bubble sort was you know with less elements much faster than what brick brick sort was because of this kernel calling overhead that needs to be taken into account when we are calling these kernels really, really quickly inside of loops on our CPU. So now you need to just take into account what sort of uh, you know, execution uh, um, gains you are getting uh, compared to the cost you are paying in order to move stuff onto the GPU and you know, perform the operations uh, through the kernels repeatedly. Um, so that was for 4,096, but it becomes even, uh, even more apparent if we take the minimum value. Um, so obviously, if we are running at 1,024 threads um, per block, then 2,048 is the smallest array size that we can deal with. Otherwise, we would have more threads than there are indices. And you will see that for 2,048 uh, indices, um, the performance was very similar on the uh, on the GPU side, but in fact, what we see is that the fastest allocation was four blocks with 256 threads each, because there's also only so much work you can do per streaming multiprocessor. So having it split up between more than one streaming multiprocessor with a fair amount of threads ended up being faster than having a single block with 1,024 threads inside of it, if you actually compare the milliseconds. But what I've circled in red is that in this setup with 2,048 elements, it was literally three times faster to do it with bubble sort than it was with brick sort. So these are the kinds of things that you need to just take into account in terms of the size of your data and the ability ability to run it in parallel to make sure that you are actually gaining the kinds of uh, performance enhancements that you actually want to get.
Now, uh, that is obviously just our uh, uh, the example algorithms that we've got, but now there are also one or two things that you need to take into account. So in all the examples up till now, we've worked on the premise that each thread is going to be accessing its own little piece of memory. So in our brick sort algorithm, each, each thread is specifically looking at one pair, and that is why they can all run in parallel, okay? But sometimes you have a situation where more than one thread needs to access the exact same point in memory, okay? And this can lead to what we call race conditions. And this is when two threads are trying to change the exact same point in, uh, or, or a point in memory at the same time. And depending on the order in which they run, this can cause you know, uh, faults in your, in your execution. Okay? An example of this where, okay, it's not necessarily a, a problem with this, but as I mentioned earlier, uh, generally when you run sort algorithms, you would have flag indicating whether your algorithm is, oh, whether your data is already sorted or not. So if you've gone through two um, uh, 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 odd and even swap operations on the GPU and none of the operations in any of the threads performed a swap, then that means that all of your indices are now in the correct order, okay? And the way to check that is to just have a single point in memory that any thread, if they perform a, sw a swap, can set that point in memory. And then you just check that single variable. If that variable is not set, your array is sorted. If the variable is set, you know that you need to go through another iteration. Um, you wouldn't use an atomic operation for that because obviously it doesn't matter if they're all going to change it to the exact same value. But there are lots of other positions or other algorithms where it does matter in which order these things happen. And we'll follow a, an example of that in a moment. So how we can overcome this problem of race conditions with, uh, with complex code is by using things called locks. So in order, in order to use a lock, you would have your piece of code in you know, however many threads it's being looked at. Um, specifically surrounded by a piece of code that locks out that section of memory while you're performing the execution on it. And every thread that gets to the lock waits at the lock until the previous thread has completed its operation and then enters the lock, takes it for itself, and then any other threads would run uh, into the lock in the same way. But that is quite complex. So running using locks can be quite complex. Um, but in our GPU example, we generally don't want super complex things. So what we can use are atomic operations. And these are operations that have read, modify, and write actions on a specific point in memory, 100% thread safe. So if you, if you in your th uh, uh, thread, perform an atomic operation on a specific point in memory, even if you are referring to the same point in memory, other threads, it is guaranteed to you that those threads will not overwrite each other's operations, even if it isn't necessarily guaranteed that, uh, that they will run in any specific order, okay? Now, there's obviously a caveat in this, in that atomic functions in CUDA can only run in device code. So they can only run in functions that have been marked as global or device, okay? They can't run in CPU code. So to just give you a simple example of this, um, here is just a program that is going to uh, perform the sum of the first n squares. Uh, and, and it's going to do the summing of each of those squares in a single accumulator. So that means there's one position in memory that has been allocated as an accumulator. Okay? And we're going to spawn 10 threads with each thread taking the thread ID that it has and squaring it, and then adding that value onto the accumulator. So what this could mean is if two threads were trying to write to the same location at the same time, one may override the other one's value, okay? Which means that you could miss one of the writes. But by making the add operation an atomic add, it means that you are guaranteed that each of those threads is going to be able to write to that location in memory and not be overwritten, okay? So they will always have the opportunity to uh, to increment that uh, uh, that variable inside of memory okay again we can't guarantee that they're going to run in any kind of order 
but that doesn't matter here because you know uh, an add operation it doesn't matter in which uh, order you add a, a bunch of numbers the answer is always going to be the same okay so this is a safe way for us to access the same location memory by multiple threads now there are quite a couple of operations that are given to us uh, inside of the libraries given to us by CUDA now um, each of these operations um, also have suffixes, okay? So if there is no suffix uh, on each of those operations, then that means that the function is going to be atomic at the scope of the device. So inside of a thread on the device, okay? Um, and that is the normal way in which they are, they are working, okay? If it has a block suffix, it means that it is going to be atomic at the scope of the block. Okay. And if it has a system suffix, it is going to be atomic at the scope of the overall system. But, and there is a link there, um, there are some conditions on that. So you can't just necessarily lock out everything, but it is quite safe. The normal ones you will use though, are obviously in the scope of the thread. Okay. Now the atomic functions that are available to you are um, CAS, so compare and swap, add, subtract, exchange, minimum, maximum, increment, and decrement. Okay, so those are the, the base functions that you will use for, uh, for calculations. There are also logical bitwise functions that you can use. So the AND, OR, and XOR operations are also supported atomically, okay? Now this feels like a small number of operations, but if you go through the CUDA programming guide, which is also um, linked at the end, you will find that the CAS operation is one of those magic operations that you can implement basically any operation with just CAS. Um, so it's similar to what you would have with uh, with logic with a NAND operation. With a NAND operation, you can sim you can simulate you know basically any other logic operation by just comparing it in different ways. And in the CUDA programming guide, they actually show a very good example of this because before CUDA um, 6.0, um, there wasn't um, atomic add as one of the options, but they show you the code for how you can do a, a device um, uh, function um, called atomic add to create that uh, that before uh, that uh, operation by simply using the atomic CAS operation in order to perform the correct uh, calculations. So you can basically implement your own operations however you want by just using combinations of atomic CAS and the other atomic operations, depending on what's available to you on your version of CUDA. So um, again, atomic operations, super important. But now we get to the point where obviously uh, a lot of the stuff we've shown you has been kind of you know from the ground up and this is you know very much how if you're doing your own kind of problem solving you may want to do this but you don't always have to do everything diy and although i'm not going to go into too much detail here again this is where it's worth looking at you know the published information that is on the cuda website because in your CUDA toolkit, there is a huge number of powerful libraries that are already set up to do most of the basic operations that you would need to do in parallel. So your role is going to be obviously to understand how those basic operations work and how parallelization works, but you want to focus more on your own problems and context. So to give you an idea, we've shown you how to do vector addition and matrix multiplication and all of those things, but the Kublas, which is the CUDA basic linear algebra subroutines library, lets you do basically all the things we've done so far um, from scratch, you can do with a library call, okay? Okay, sorting, not so much, but there are other libraries that actually allow you to do sorting in, in an optimal way. So the, the main math libraries that are going to be relevant is the um, basic linear, al uh, linear algebra one. Um, there's a tensor library, which obviously lets you do massive things with, uh, with matrices of any kind of dimensions. Um, there's uh, uh, libraries for dealing with sparse matrices, sparse tensors. There is a logic solver, 
um, that is useful. There is a fast Fourier transform if you're going to be doing any kind of signal analysis type stuff. That's quite useful. And then also what I've used so far is the standard C++ libraries in order to create random numbers. But there's also CUDA versions that can use the CUDA hardware in order to generate us some um, random numbers as well. Uh, so there's a, a huge number of these uh, of these libraries available to you, and it is very worthwhile just having a look see to see what tools are available to you before you do everything from scratch. Okay, and that leads me to just the last point. So obviously we are now at a point where we can start giving people some some access to to a cluster in order to play around. A huge thank you to Professor Analaba Roy for for helping us with this access. So there are some rules around how to how to actually use the the cluster effectively and uh, and not uh, dominate it and uh, and use it in a in a sensible way. So if you will please just send an email with uh, with your details to the two email addresses that are shared there. So there's Prof Martin's one as well as my address. So you can just send to both of us at the same time. Uh, Prof Martin is just having a bit of a problem with his Stellenbosch address. So as soon as that's sorted, you can use that as well. But for now, just use the backup Gmail. Then um, that is, and then we will send you the rules as well as the process in order to get signed up uh, because you do need to, to register for a, a, a a remote access uh, um, service. Then um, all of the programs that we've used as examples in this course are available in a Git repository called CUDA course, uh, which is uh, available at the link that is there, which we'll obviously uh, share. And then the course slides and any of the other materials that we've uh, that we've added is still available in the Dropbox that we've shared previously, but here it is on the slide as well in order for you to access it directly. And then obviously at the end, as with all the other slides, there are uh, references at the end to just getting a bit more information if you are interested in any of the things that have been referenced. Okay, and that pretty much brings me to the end of my lesson today. I hope that you enjoyed it and thank you all for your attention. Graham, I think it's over to you now. Graham, Martin, can you hear me? Uh, yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, are there any questions that uh, uh, that uh, that have slipped by so far, Martin, or have you managed to grab everything? I think I've answered them all. Yeah. Okay. okay. Oh, there's one um, from Anna Lapa. Can CPU parallelization metrics carp flat be adapted for um, GPUs? So metrics, I would assume yes. I, I must admit I'm not 100% sure about that one. Uh, but I mean, obviously the same concepts would uh, would would be relevant if you are doing things in a multi-threaded way, whether those threads be on a CPU or a GPU. Um, and in fact, if you look at the, uh, specifically on the Windows side, uh, when you install the CUDA uh, toolkit, there is a huge amount of, uh, um, uh, of, of insight that can be gained with the tools that are installed at the same time. So you can track everything and graph everything. It's a, there's a huge amount of, uh, um, of, of toolkit that comes with the, the main installation. So, so yes, uh, carb flat, I'm not sure specifically, uh, but, uh, but yes, there are absolutely metrics that you can pull that I'm assuming would be very similar between the, uh, the two hardware setups. Okay, then Graham, are you, are you with us yet?
Johnny, I see your hand, but uh, I don't think I can, I have permission to let you speak in this webinar. Can you maybe type out your, um, uh, your question? Thank you very much, Sigrid. This was, uh, um, this was very much the idea to, to have its focus specifically on beginners. Um, there are obviously lots more uh, relevant uh, things that you can do as you get more advanced, but I think from a beginner's perspective, there's quite a lot you can do just with, uh, with these basic tools. Um, Johnny, in terms of the presentation sent to your email, um, that would be difficult because I don't necessarily have all of your emails. That is why we obviously share it on the link uh, so that you can just pull it down from everywhere. Having it specifically sent to people is going to be um, yeah, it's going to be quite a pain. So I think the easiest is to get it from, from the Dropbox. Um, is the access to the cluster exclusively for NWU students and affiliates? No. Um, so the idea is actually more for the participants of this uh, mini school. Um, so it's not specific to NWU students or Stellenbosch students. It's more specific to uh, NITEX uh, associates and, uh, and, uh, and postgraduate students. Um, so, so no, there's no limitation to being only for NWU students. Okay. Uh, when should one send an email for the cluster? You can send it this afternoon. Thank you, Viduranga. I'm very glad that uh, that you enjoyed it. It was actually quite fun uh, presenting to you all. It was uh, it was a fun fun mini school to do. Okay, I don't see any further questions. So Graham, just the last check to see if you're still with us. If not, then uh, thank you all very much for, for attending our mini school. Um, it was a pleasure having you all here and uh, um, I really hope that you that you learned something and that you will continue to, to learn from, uh, from the slides and obviously all the references that have been linked. And if you have any other questions that uh, that we didn't cover here that uh, that come up to you a bit later, please feel free to to email myself and Prof Martin. Um, thank you all for your attention. Martin, do you want to just say a final a final goodbye as well? Um, yeah. Well, well, thanks everyone for attending, and this has been fun for us. Absolutely great. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a great afternoon. Further, goodbye.